Oh, hi there. In my last video, I talked about the previously lost song, Two Foot of Butt Crack, from the movie Dumb and Dumber, and it got me thinking. There are a lot of weird lost songs, and not just songs by obscure bands, though there's plenty of those, but we're talking a lost theme song by Kurt Cobain, new wave music by comedian Ricky Gervais, a Yahoo exclusive Weird Al remix, and even a lost album by a former world leader. I'm sure that won't cause any drama in the comment section. Some of these songs are so strange, their very existence remains unconfirmed. If you know any other strange lost songs or have ideas for another video, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Lost Media Mike. So so here are 10 bizarre lost songs. I released my own single. <laughs> so if that's a waste of money. Well, it is a waste of money because you didn't even get in the top 100. Good, didn't want it to. Sonoa Dancing's Lost Demo. In 1982, a pre fame Ricky Gervais teamed up with Bill McRae, forming the British new wave band Sonoa Dancing. The band was Gervais's first performance experience, actually predating his work as an actor. McRae was tasked with writing the band's music and playing keyboard, and Gervais wrote the lyrics and sang. After a short time, the two recorded a 16-track demo, which must have been pretty good because it got them signed to London Records. After being signed, they released two singles, More to Lose and Bitter Heart. A music video was made for Bitter Heart, and More to Lose was played live on the show Razzmatazz. More to Lose reached 117, and Bitter Heart reached 79 on the UK charts. But this wasn't good enough for the band or the label, and in 1984, Sanoa Dancing broke up. Though the group never made it big, they surprisingly did have a lot of popularity in the Philippines. The year after the band broke up, the radio station DWRT-FM began playing their music, but changed the name of the song and the band so no other station could find the song, making it a station exclusive. They even went as far as to put their own station ID in the middle of the track so stations couldn't even record it off the air. After a year, DWRT identified the song as More to Lose by Sanoa Dancing, and the track would go on to be a major radio and club hit in the Philippines, rivaling new wave juggernauts like Joy Division in the country. Despite this success, only four songs from the band can be found online, More to Lose and Bitter Heart of course, and their b-sides, Tell Her and You're on My Side, both of which can be assumed to be on the unnamed demo. In a 2018 interview on the Jim and Sam show, Gervais talked about his time in the band and even played what he called his most embarrassing song, Johnny, but this song was written after Noah dancing and it is terrible. I'll link the interview, it's hilarious. But the demo tape that got them signed has never been released and it's unclear if any copies still exist and it seems Gervais has no interest in tracking it down. It's also unknown what became of Gervais' bandmate Billy McRae. Finding McRae is currently our best bet at finding Sanoa Dancing's lost demo. The Lost Burton Ernie Sample Active in the late 80s, early 90s New York hip-hop scene, KMD were among the pioneers of the genre. The group consisted of Rodon, DJ Subrock, and Zev Love X, who would go on to be one of the all-time great lyricists, hip-hop's mad villain, MF Doom. In 91, the group dropped their debut album, Mr. Hood, and promoted it with the single Who Me, accompanied by the song Hum Rush as a B-side. These two songs share a unique common factor. They both sampled Sesame Street, particularly Bert and Ernie. This proved to be a very unusual case of lost media, where we have the songs, the album sold very well and can be easily streamed, but the source of their samples were a mystery. The two songs and their variations contained three Bert and Ernie samples. Hum Rush starts with a sample of the two talking, the instrument version of Who Me contains brief Burton and Ernie dialogue near the end, and the album version of Who Me has a long back and forth between MF Doom, Burt, and even Grover. The search for the elusive samples was initiated in 2017 by the Sample Spotters, a Facebook group that identifies samples. Their first hurdle was figuring out if the sample came from a commercial release or a home recording. The Sample Spotters were able to get in contact with one of the album's producers, who confirmed that the sample was taken from a commercial release, but had no more information. The trail went cold for years, but on May 15th, 2020, member of the Muppet Wiki, Muppet Dude, was able to identify the elusive sample as a cassette tape that came with the Sesame Street book, Shapes and Colors, Ernie's Favorites. Until Muppet Dude made the tape widely known, it was not available anywhere on the internet. Days later, the full cassette was posted to YouTube. Not only did Muppet Dude uncover a nearly 30-year-old mystery, but made a rare Sesame Street tape available that may have otherwise been lost to time and forgotten. Grace and Gwen, so, so, suck your toe. 
Grace and Gwen are a mysterious indie duo that virtually nothing was known about outside of their involvement in a 2004 split EP with fellow indie band Someone Still Loves You Boris Yeltsin, titled So So Suck Your Toe. The EP had five songs by Boris Yeltsin, all of which have surfaced, and three tracks by Grace and Gwen, which have all gone missing. Even the identity of Grace and Gwen were completely unknown until 2016 when Lost Media Wiki user Katie and the Coconut discovered Grace and Gwen had a closer relationship with their collaborators than just a split EP. Grace, identified as Grace Bentley, married lead singer Philip Dickey, and Gwen was found to be the sister of the guitarist, Will Nauer. And this was actually the first time the band was confirmed to exist outside of the obscure release. Through some more digging, a 2004 write-up about Someone Still Loves You Boris Yeltsin was found that showed Boris Yeltsin would occasionally act as the backing band for Grace and Gwen, but usually it was just Grace on guitar. This write-up also talked about the EP that was still untitled at the time. On the untitled EP, the band has a warm, almost unplugged sound recalling the texture of indie rock bands like Pavement. The article also shed some light on the album's obscurity. The EP was exclusive to 50 copies, each with a hand-sewn cloth sleeve made by friend of the band, Katie Frederick. Following the release of the EP, Grace and Gwen seemed to have broken up, but would still occasionally collaborate with Someone Still Loves You, Boris Yeltsin. Gwen provided additional vocals on their debut album, and Grace was a featured vocalist on the album Fly By Wire, also credited as a co-writer, and provided additional voices on the song Bigger Than Your Yard. Grace has since teamed up with her husband, Philip Dickey, to form the group Dragon Inn 3. Though we finally have access to the voices of Grace and Gwen, their debut project remains lost. TAS 1000 TAS 1000 is one of the most unusual bands I have ever come across. They formed in 2002 after member Matt Crisco bought a used Sanyo TAS 1000 answering machine at Value Village. He discovered that the machine still had the cassette tape in it from the previous owner, Martha, with her messages still intact. He and his friends became obsessed with these recordings, manipulating the words until they became meaningless and rhythmic, forming a band based on these unique sounds, naming themselves after the answering machine's model, TAS 1000. The band had three rules, one message per song, songs must be based on the message's musical merit primarily, and no recycling messages. Not only did the group make unusual music, but their stage antics were equally unconventional and sometimes outright dangerous. The group was known for damaging venues, letting out swarms of bees on the audience, Not the bees! and accepting payment in the form of jars of bees that they could use in their shows. They would even claim to be sponsored by various boating companies, prompting a lawsuit. There was even a rumor that the previous owner of the cassette tape sued the band, but she claims this never happened, that she approved of their music and the band even visited her. Even though their music was strange and their stage presence was adversarial. Their music received a positive write-up in the Canadian entertainment publication Exclaim. In 2006, they referred to their music as a catchy, well-crafted musical accomplishment, an often poignant collection, and even compared the band to Picasso. The band performed their farewell concert in 2005, and after only two songs, they stopped the show and destroyed the original TAS 1000 answering machine, marking the end of the band. Today, they're best known for the song, I've Been Delayed, that was used in Club Penguin. After their breakup, they made the 2006 documentary, Stagnant Bog, featuring the band throwing away 300 copies of their unsold music into a local bog, inspired by the burial of unsold E.T. Atari cartridges. The documentary is not available online, and its existence remains unconfirmed. The band's music remains elusive as well. Their debut album, A Message for Martha, has been found in its entirety. Only one track has been found from its follow-up, the Florian EP, but the song that was found didn't fit the band's rules and was scrapped. It's unknown if there were any more songs that were meant for this EP. And their final release, Ron Rondin Calling, has a rumored bonus track that hasn't been found. The group also had a few songs that didn't fit their rule sets that were scrapped, like the track Right On Girl that was meant for the Florian EP, but this remains the only scrapped song that's been recovered. But alongside their lost music and lost documentary, of the original 32 messages from Martha's answering machine, only two have been recovered. Given the band's tendency towards trolling, I bet they have all the music, the documentary, and the messages, but never plan on releasing them, giving a fitting ending to the ever-alluring, strange music of TAS 1000. Pink Floyd's Household Objects, The Lost Third Song 
Following the release of Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd reached untold levels of success, making the band one of the most popular of their generation. The album is well within the top 10 best selling of all time and still routinely pushes 8,000 to 9,000 copies on a slow week. The band weren't sure where to go after such a monumental success, so like other bands following a groundbreaking album, they took to experimentation. But Pink Floyd might have taken things a bit too far. They planned to follow up one of the most cohesive, compelling albums of all time with a project called Household Objects. Recorded over a few years, the project would have shelved guitars and traditional instruments in favor of found objects like wine glasses, spray cans, brooms, rubber bands, and the like. They had plenty of experience using unusual sounds, like in the songs Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast, Fearless, and of course the cash register sounds in Money. But a full album of this kind of music was unprecedented for the band, and honestly any other rock band at the time. They began work on the album during the recording of their 1971 project, Metal, and again in 1973. Drummer Alan Mason wrote in his book, Inside Out, A Personal History of Pink Floyd. In 1973, it took us two months to assemble, slowly and laboriously, what could now probably be done in an afternoon. After a number of weeks, musical progress was negligible, and the whole project was gently laid to rest. They decided to release Wish You Were Here instead of Household Objects. I think they made the right choice. Only the sounds of wine glasses heard on the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond survived the scrapped album. Tracks from Household Objects wouldn't be heard from again until over 35 years later with the release of the 2011-2012 compilation of Pink Floyd's back catalog, Why Pink Floyd, featuring two tracks from the ill-fated album, The Hard Way and Wine Glasses. Though we have these two tracks from the sessions, due to the mystery surrounding the band's post-Dark Side of the Moon work and how much time they spent on the Household Objects concept, there's a rumored third track. In Nick Mason's book, he says about the album, the most we ever achieved was a small number of tentative rhythms rhythm tracks. The line, a small number of rhythm tracks, has been interpreted by fans to mean more than two and that there are still unreleased songs from household objects. And according to a now deleted Lost Media wiki page, stemming from a Lost Media archive page, the household objects page on the Spanish, French, Italian, and Catalan versions of Wikipedia mentioned the possibility of a third track. With how long the band spent on the idea, they likely did have additional songs in the works, but judging by the glacial pace of production and the primitive tech they used in the 70s to make music with found objects, a third track probably never made it far enough to warrant a release, even on a compilation of demos. I suspect any more songs from the album would be terribly disappointing if ever released. And nearly half a century later, the third song from Household Objects remains an unsubstantiated rumor. James Ferrero's Summer Head Rush 2009 series. James Ferrero's 2011 album, Far Side Virtual, is considered the first vaporwave album, a polarizing genre of electronic music known for its ironic use of consumer culture, sampling commercials, infomercials, product demonstrations, and stock music. The genre's expanded out of these constraints, but that's where it started. Throughout his long career, Ferrero has been extremely prolific, with at least 32 albums, and I say at least because a large amount of his early catalog has gone missing. Before breaking ground with his Vaporwave release, Ferrero released a series of psychedelic, new age projects he called the Summer Head Rush 2009 series, giving each of the 12 albums a catalog number of 1 through 12. These 12 albums were produced on homemade CDRs through his own record label and even received some marketing. But of the 12 discs, there are three that are still missing. Too Hot for TV, Cyberflower, and Neo City Estro Sim. But in addition to these albums that were given catalog numbers, there are seven that were seen in promotional materials that have never been heard from since. Why they weren't given catalog numbers is unknown, but based on the file names from the online promos, each of the albums have assumed names. Angel, Angels with Tongue Rings, Cyber Suspension, Grid Species, Hearts of Paradise, and Oxygen. With the rise of Vaporwave across internet message boards, the early works of one of the pioneers of the genre became highly sought after, but despite enthusiastic search efforts, not much has emerged. In 2020, the album Grid Species was found, but the fan consensus is that it's fake. The album Rehysteria is possibly partially found, but again, its validity is called into question. And outtakes from Hearts of Paradise have been uncovered that are generally considered to be real. It was believed that these 12 cataloged albums and the seven unnumbered albums accounted for everything from the Summer Head Rush era. But in response to the delay of his 2016 album, Human Story 3, Ferrero bundled the release with the unreleased CDR album, Speed, showing that there may be more from the series that we don't know of. And it also shows that the notoriety and mystery behind the Head Rush series is not lost on Ferrero or his record label. And based on their previous interactions, they probably still have copies of the music. 
and the fact that they did release previously unreleased music shows they have it in their power to release more. Yahoo's Weird Al Remix in early 1999, Yahoo collaborated with the now defunct music software developer Beatnik to create Yahoo Music Beatnik Groovegrams. Groovegrams allowed players to make their own remixes of a handful of songs in browser, like tracks by Blondie, Puff Daddy, Yes, Moby, Britney Spears, and most importantly of all, Weird Al Yankovic. Yahoo even held remix contests from November 18, 1999 to January 10, 2000, allowing users to enter their own remixes to win prizes like signed albums, tickets, and even an accordion signed by Weird Al. Yahoo marketed the contest as the ultimate in fan-celebrity interaction that gives fans a new forum to become more of the entertainer than the entertained. To promote the contest, Weird Al released an official remix of his song Pretty Fly for a Rabbi that was exclusive to the site made with the Beatnik program. Remixes made in the browser could not be downloaded, though the tracks could be saved on the site. So when the contest page became defunct, all remixes were lost, including the official remix of Pretty Pretty Fly for a Rabbi. The Beatnik player can still be found on CNET, just waiting for the remix of Pretty Fly for a Rabbi to be found. One day the scraggly kid comes in and said he wanted to write a song for Ren and Stimpy and they, they said, yeah, that's great, and they threw it in the wastebasket. Oh. It was Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain's Ren and Stimpy theme song. Ren and Stimpy, along with the Rugrats and Doug, were Nickelodeon's first Nicktoons, all three debuting on August 11th, 1991. They are all classics, but Ren and Stimpy's run was much shorter than the others, being taken off the air for its heavy use of sexual innuendos, dark humor, and violence that's had a long-lasting effect on modern, raunchy, hyper-violent adult cartoons. Like for real, most of these jokes would be on Adult Swim today. <laughs> These dark themes seems to have attracted the attention of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain, who allegedly wrote a theme song for the show. The story is that in between the release of the 1989 album Bleach and the revolutionary Nevermind, Kurt showed up at Spunko Animation headquarters, saying he wanted to write a song for the show, presenting them with a demo tape. They didn't like the song and were upset by Kurt's arrogance and asked him to leave. Decades later, the song has never surfaced and its validity has been called into question. So far, the only person inside Spunko's offices to confirm the track is Stimpy voice actor Billy West, who talked about the lost song on the Nerdist podcast. In a 2019 interview with show creator John Crick Falusi, he said he never heard of the rumor, nor does he recall the meeting. It's been suggested by Nirvana fans that the theme song could be the instrumental track, The Happy Guitar, released on 2015's Montage of Heck, the home recordings. The sounds pretty out of place in Kurt's catalog. And this brings up an interesting point. The Montage of Heck album was criticized for treating even Cobain's most mundane recordings as a commercial release. The Guardian even referred to the collection as recordings of Kurt Cobain making farting noises. This album, along with other posthumous Nirvana releases, account for nearly everything Kurt Cobain recorded, no matter how trivial, with very few examples of unreleased music. If Kurt did record a theme song for Ren and Stimpy, it likely would have already been made public, if he did keep a copy, and it seems like he did keep most of his material. I'll leave a link to the happy guitar in the description so you can decide for yourself. Preschool Musical on a Stick in December 2008, PBS Kids Sprout aired a parody of High School Musical called Preschool Musical on a Stick, featuring stick puppet characters from different Sprout shows. The Sunny Side Up show, the Sprout Sharing show, the Good Night show with Nina and Star, and the Let's Go Musical Mornings with Koo. The art style is pretty jarring, especially for something made in the 2000s, but the thought behind it is actually pretty cute. On the Sprout's website, you could print off character sheets that could be cut out and glued to a popsicle stick to play along with the musical, so the quality of the production matches what kids can make at home. Adorable. And it's pretty genius. You get to make a cheap production and get the viewers involved in a fun way. If the show didn't already have enough gimmicks, the comically low budget, the crossover event, and at-home participation, it was also a holiday special, complete with songs about snow days and being with friends and family. Tracks from the musical were briefly available for download on the Sprout website, iTunes, and 500 physical CDs that were given away as part of a limited promotional deal. By some accounts, the songs were downloadable from the website as late as 2011. Following its limited release and airing on PBS, the musical was completely lost until 2017 when four music videos from the musical were posted on Vimeo by Meredith Halpern, who played a role in making the musical. In 2020, Lost Media Wiki user Chocolate Circus 445 found the CD on Amazon and uploaded the soundtrack to archive.org. While we now have the complete music, most of the footage is still lost. 
But through this search, an even more obscure piece of lost media appeared. Its lost sequel, of course named Preschool Musical on Two Sticks. Airing the following year in 2009, this one seems to have only aired on TV with no evidence of a physical or digital release. And the only evidence that this thing exists at all comes from a single promotional video. Based on the short video, the Wiggles were now added to the roster, but all the sets, character models, and songs seem to be the same with just a few added voices. Taking the promo at face value, it appears to be an updated version of the first musical, remade using the same sets and characters, but it could be a combination of old footage with interpolations of new footage we can't really say for sure until we find out more information. We are currently missing three music videos from the first preschool musical and the entirety of its sequel. You are stealing right to jail. You're playing music too loud, right to jail, right away. You're charging too high prices for uh, sweaters, glasses, you right to jail. The Lost Album of Hugo Chavez. So this one's gonna talk about politics and Venezuela. Politics can lead to some really great discussions, but in the internet comment sections, they tend to be less than productive. So I just ask that you be respectful. Hugo Chavez was the 45th president of Venezuela and remains a highly polarizing figure to this day, whose critics claim that he ran an authoritarian regime with heavy use of propaganda. One of his most powerful tools of propaganda was his own weekly talk show, Hello Presidente, or Hello Mr. President. You heard that right, a world leader had his own TV show, and this wasn't just some experiment that fizzled out. Hello Mr. President aired seven hour episodes nearly every Sunday for 13 years, adding up to 378 episodes. The show is known for being pretty boring. I mean, we're talking a political figure with no entertainment experience trying to fill seven hours. But this was counteracted with surrealist humor and Chavez even giving military orders on air. It's even been said that Chavez created more policies on air than he did in the Capitol. In one notable 2007 episode, Hugo Chavez announced his debut album, Canciones de Siempre, translating to Songs of Always. A major political figure dropping an album while in office is weird to say the least. Chavez was at least known for singing during his speeches. During the episode, Chavez shows the album cover, featuring himself in a hat holding a microphone wearing his typical red shirt. The album would have Chavez himself singing traditional Venezuelan songs and Mexican ranchera music. <laughs> I hope no originals, but he made no reference to specific songs or a release date. And after its announcement, the LP was never heard from again. One possibility is that the project was just a compilation of Chavez singing during his speeches, something he did all the time. This might be easier to believe than a world leader with a 7 hour weekly TV spot having time to stop by the recording studio to spit some fire. But with Chavez's penchant for theatrics and reliance on propaganda, I I honestly wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> and in researching this lost album, it looks like all the audio from Hello Mr. President has been archived, but I had a hard time finding video for the show. There's only a few on YouTube, leading me to believe there might be more lost than just the album. Even some of the show's more infamous moments, like Chavez hosting the show in a field of cows, I haven't been able to find. It remains unknown if the album was ever distributed, and it does have a few reviews on Rate Your Music, pretty much exclusively one-star reviews. So maybe someone has it, or it's just a politically motivated joke. I'll let you decide. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I had so much fun making this video and I'm so grateful for all the love and support I get in the comments. It's so unbelievable that so many people watch my videos. I still can't get over it. Let me know what else you want me to cover and I'll see if I can fit it into a future video. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.